Every convergence sequence is a Cauchy sequence, for always. But not every Cauchy sequence is convergent. However, if you're talking about real numbers or complex numbers or vectors in the Hilbert space, yes, every Cauchy sequence is convergent. But rational numbers, you can design Cauchy sequences that aren't convergent to any other rational number, okay? Like the one, the expansion of pi or e or whatever. So that's the answer there. And the fact that all Cauchy sequences of real and complex numbers have limits, that's sort of built into the real and complex numbers. You can't really prove that. It's, they're rigged so that that's true. In a sense, what you do is you take the rationals and you add in enough things so every Cauchy sequence is going to have a limit. Erica? Yeah, regarding the test tomorrow, uh, there, you don't have any notes or equation sheets or anything like that. And I'll try to remind you of what notation means if I think it's the least bit obscure. Like, if you look at the, the test from last fall, you'll notice there, there's a, it's going to look a lot like that except that the questions will be different. <laughs> um, <laughs> the thing is that, like, the, the problem that has ZA in it and ZA star, I remind you what those are. Okay, I, I don't expect you to, oh, what did he mean by that silly notation that he made out for this class? So, Nathan. If, if you have a question about something on that prelim, can I explain it? I could, but I, I don't want to get into a whole theater of that today. Okay, I don't, I don't want to do a whole bunch of those today. Someone asked one last night on, on Piazza, for example, and I answered it right away. But what, what's your question? <laughs> Why don't, yeah, why don't you ask that one? Why don't you ask me about after, after class? How about that? Could you? Or do you have to run to practice or something? Okay, maybe during the break. Yeah, I, I know the one you're talking about. I th that, that one is going to take too long, I think. So. Any other questions? Yeah, David. Um, I have a question about causality. Yep. The output can't anticipate the input. Yeah. But um, I was looking, and so we can solve that by applying the impulse response and seeing if anything happens before the impulse. Yeah. So, but what I was looking at is there was a particular one where uh, the signal was just like it takes, um, let's say, x of n and just does x of 3n. Yep. Yes. That's right. It's not causal. Did the solution say it was? I'll have to go fix that then. Or someone I try to No. That's not an LTI system. That's why that criterion doesn't work. That. Yeah. It's not time invariant. The system that takes input with specification x of n and gives you output with specification x of 3n turns out not to be time invariant. So that impulse response criterion for causality doesn't apply. That applies only to time invariant systems. <laughs> Condolences? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that, that's the basic idea of causality. If you, if you plug in a value n into the output, and to compute the output at that time n requires that you know the input at some future time, not causal. Causal is off. Fair enough. Any other questions? Don't be shy. James. Um, in like applications, do you ever see, like, do you ever use, like, do you ever, this is, that's a good question, do you ever use non-causal systems and applications? And the answer is yes, but in those applications, the variable n doesn't really represent time. It represents something else, like space, or uh, position in an image, say, something like that. If you do image processing or data post-processing, 
that sort of thing. The same kinds of systems that we use for signal analysis come into play, convolutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the variable that indexes the signals isn't really time. It's something else. It's like position. So, or, or, uh, or it's a position in an array of data, say, if you're doing data post-processing. So that's where they come up. Nothing you can build that actually processes real time signals is going to be non-causal, unless the rules of the universe get rewritten, which is always a possibility. We keep hearing about neutri neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light, and we find out they didn't, but you know, that, who knows what, what's going to happen next year. Uh, okay, uh, flip a coin, Erica. <laughs> The, th the question is, do you have to, if you're looking, if you're trying to decide whether a system is causal or non-causal, does it suffice to do sort of an intuitive kind of like, hmm, okay, for, for time three, the value of output at time three depends on output input at time seven, so it's not causal. That's perfectly fine. You no need to sit down and do any equations on that. Ricardo. Well, it's all the discrete time stuff, whatever that would be. And I think that I transitioned in the middle of a lecture. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember. Yeah, because are, are filters good? No, no. So that's all like Yeah, that's, that's all in continuous time. Yeah. Nathan. Oh, multiple choice. It's, they're not really multiple choice. They're, they're like true-false, essentially. Each of the, the, the test is going to look just like the one last year, except the questions will be a little different. Each situation, I state a scenario, and then I say, you could be certain that, boom, 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 boom. Okay, and all of them could be so, or none of them, or one of them, or two of them, or three. And you just get two points for each bullet. Okay, that's it. Um, so, you know, within a given foursome, <laughs> You could get a couple wrong and a couple right. You know that's that's possible. It's not like you're you're screwed if you answer one of them incorrectly. If that's your question, yeah. Not for that. No, no partial credit on those short answers. I'll pretend I can't read. Okay, you can only see what's circled or X or something like that. Juice young. It's going to be exactly the same format as last fall. It's going to be like oh, the, ten or the yeah, ten or eleven <laughs> questions with short answer, true, false, and then the one where you have to do a convolution or two, that kind of thing. And another technical question is: um, there's a definition about causality that you can talk on the monograph. Um, it says like an LTI system S with mapping from X to F to Z is causal, yeah. mm -hmm. but for every n in there. Mm -hmm. I, X1 and X2 are two input signals in X such that... X I know the difference, yeah. You don't have to... Blah, 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 blah. Right. And then it also says that the output value of those two input signals must equal for every K less than mm -hmm. N. I don't get why that, that's going to... That that's the way you can make that rigorous. That's the way that you can state rigorously the following intuitive characterization of causality. Quote, the current value of the output does not depend on the future values of the input, unquote. That's the informal definition of causality, right? right? The way you mathematize that is to say the following. Whenever you have two inputs that agree up to time n, right. then the outputs arising from those two inputs also have to agree up to time n. And that statement is true for every n. Because that's the same for an LTI system, that's the same thing as saying the current value of the output can never depend on the future values of the input. And that definition that you were reading says just what I said. If for every time n, the following statement holds, whenever I have two inputs that agree up to time n, their outputs, corresponding outputs have to agree up to time n, then the system is causal. So if it doesn't agree up to time, like after time n, well, no, th that statement has to hold for every n. You, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's kind of a uh, slightly complicated string of quantifiers. You know, for all n and for all x1 and x2, if 
blah blah blah, then blah blah blah. You know. Because like when it the way it's saying it just seems like it's talking about consistency of the system rather than causality. Consistency? Because like you know you have x one and x two which are equal. Mm -hmm. And you have like the outputs that are equal to then pretty much you're saying you input this signal and then you have another signal that is the same pretty much up to time n then you're going to have the same outputs. It just kind of shows me consistency of the system rather than the causality of the system. For, the, for this kind of a system, when you're processing whole input signals into whole output signals, consistency and causality tend to get merged in some sense. Okay? When you have a state variable system like you see in control theory, then you have to separate those two concepts, but that's beyond our scope right here. So. Okay. Erica? No, I, uh, on the homework, uh, not this last homework, but homework before that, you yeah. kind of apply convolution to a real life scenario. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, the bank account yeah. thing, yeah. I wasn't really sure on what, like, I guess, like, the in words form of what we were doing with that. Like, I understood, you know, we're taking the values that were used and we figured out what we're doing here, but um, using the formula we found in the no, you're convolved. Did you look at the solutions yet? Yeah. But yeah, what <clears throat> the thing is when you when you when you look at compound interest, how that works on a bank account, it's kind of like your inputs to the system are strings of incomes, monthly incomes. Like that's your input signal. It's like a discrete time signal whose time value is like month, right, mm -hmm. and whose range value is how much money you put in the bank account. Okay. And w you never spend anything, so we're not worrying about out outflow. What happens in the bank account is, using compound interest, you know, each, the next month you have previous month plus R times the previous month. So it's one plus R times the previous month. And it turns out that if you work out the math, that comes out to be the following. You're convolving your input signal, your income string, with this function H which is 0 for n less than 0 and 1 plus r to the n for n bigger than 0. So the, the moral of that problem, as it were, is that convolution does play a role in a real-life scenario. You know, you don't have to think about your bank account in terms of convolution, but I'm saying that you can. You can think about it that way. Is that fair? Okay, so it's like the way to something with also a yeah, I mean, everything, everything in your bank account at time zero, as long as you don't take it out, is still going to be compounded interest on at time any n, you know, even past when you quit working, even past n equals 359 or whatever it was. Okay? Any other questions? Sachit? Say that again? Uh, I, how do you show a signal is absolutely summable? Well, you, you, it's hard to do. It, it's, it, there's some where you can actually figure out the sum exactly, like geometric series. But the best way I know how is to try to bound the absolute value of the signal from above by something that's easy to compute, like a geometric that's absolutely summable, or a constant times geometric. That's what I would do. Anything else? Douglas. Will the encryption stuff be on the exam? Well, it sort of implicitly is because the modular arithmetic stuff was, but I won't say, uh, you know, like in the Hellman Diffie Merkel scheme, you know, does this happen or this or this or this, and have you tease apart what's RSA versus what's Hellman Diffie Merkel, you know, that kind of thing. If, if, does that answer your question? Yeah. Anything else? Okay, well, I hope we have as good a turnout tomorrow. <laughs> Good questions, everybody. And I'm, I was almost late today because I had a doctor's appointment, and then I got behind this one of those mowers 
on the road coming back, and I was like going on like 10 miles an hour, and like, come on, come on, come on. And so I didn't have time to get anything to eat, so if I keel over from hunger during the lecture, that's why. Um, didn't even have time to swing by my office and grab my laptop. So got here just in time, so I have to look and see where we're up to. Um, yeah. Okay. And are we, is our sound working now back there, camera person? Excellent. Okay. So this is not on the prelim, so while my back is turned, you can steal away if you wish. Gauntlet thrown. Okay? All right. Okay, so what were we up to? We had this, this awesome, important theorem about orthogonal expansions in the Hilbert space. So the big theorem, and I'm not going to remind you of the definitions of everything, it goes like this. If V is a Hilbert space, and I have a set WK, and, and this could be a finite or countably infinite, but I'm going to assume here it's countably infinite because that's going to be our application. And if that is a complete orthonormal set, in V, then you have for every V, little v in capital V, you have what I call an orthogonal expansion of V as what one might call an infinite linear combo of the WKs. And to be precise about that, see, people are leaving. I didn't see who they were, though. One of them was tall. That's all I noticed. OK. OK, infinite linear combo of, of the WK in the sense that if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of v minus Sn of v, I get 0, where Sn of v just going to be the sum from k equals minus n to n of v inner product wk wk and remember what this guy is the intuition behind this this is the projection of v onto the span of this set of w's the span of the set of all wk where minus n is less than or equal to k is less than or equal to n. And I tried to give you some intuition behind this. The idea is that if you look at this span as a subspace, as n increases, that subspace expands, gets bigger and bigger. The projection of v on that subspace gets closer and closer to v. And the reason it actually approaches v is that the w's are a complete orthonormal set. The w's expand to encompass all of v. And that's pretty much where we were at last time. And after class, somebody, was it Tim? I'm trying to remember. Somebody said, what does this have to do with signals? Is that what you said? No. And I said, you'll see. OK, so now you'll see. If you haven't figured it out already or read about it. So let's pose the rhetorical question. What do we use this for? And today is going to be our first use of it. And later when we talk about the Haar wavelets, that's going to be our second use of it. So what is our first use? Our first use is 
as you probably guessed, recast Fourier series as that kind of thing. And how do we do that exactly? Given t0, that's a positive number. Re recall that capital X t0 is the set of all decent signals. that have T0 as a period. And XT0 is a subspace of the set of all continuous time signals that's closed under shifting. And that's a good thing. All right? Now, this turns out to be an inner product space. So, XT0 is an inner product space. And how are we going to define the inner product? I'm going to set inner product of X with Y equal to 1 over T0 integral over any interval of length T0. And let's pin it down to be 0 to T0. What the heck? X of T y bar of t, where bar is complex conjugate, is usual dt for any x and y. And you can check, make sure that this satisfies all the properties an inner product has to satisfy. What's the associated norm? So note the associated norm. is the square root of the inner product of any x with itself, which is this. It's 1 over t0, integral from 0 to t0, x of t magnitude squared, dt to the 1 half. And what would an ECE call that number? Yeah, the RMS value of the signal x. Root mean square. And we alluded to this when we talked about L2 of all the way. But this is, those were energy type signals in the lingo. And these are what we call power type signals. They don't have finite energy, but they have a finite energy per unit time. And the root mean square value of that is that. Anyway. OK, so, so xt0 is an inner product space. For each k in the integers, let WK, and this WK is going to be a signal in XT0, be the signal with specification WK of T equals E to the J K omega zero T for all T. And here, as usual, omega zero is two pi over T zero. So you have one of those for every integer. Fact. set of all wk such that k is in the integers is a complete orthonormal set in xt0. Complete, hard to prove. Orthonormal, easy to prove. So it's hard to prove complete. I don't even prove that in the monograph. But orthonormal is easy. How does that go? If I take WK, inner product with WL, 
the definition of that is 1 over t0, integral from 0 to t0 of e to the wk of t is e to the positive jk omega 0 t, and wl bar of t is e to the minus jl omega 0 t, integrate that dt, and that's just 1 over t0, integral from 0 to t0 of e to the j parentheses k minus l omega 0 t dt. And if you do that integral out, when k equals l, the whole integrand is 1. So the integ integral comes out to be t0. You get a 1 over t0 times a t0, and you get 1 when k equals l. <coughs> and when k is not equal to l, you can actually do out the integral. You can divide by 1 over jk, blah, 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 and you get 1 over j k minus l. Omega 0 t0 is 2 pi. <coughs> e to the jk minus l 2 pi minus 1. And that is 0. And that's when k is not equal to l. Bottom line, the w's are orthonormal. The fact that they're complete, like I said, is a hard one. We, it's, we can't do that at this level. OK, so far so good. We have an inner product space, xt0, set of all decent signals have t0 as a period. We have a complete orthonormal set in that inner product space. So what's to stop us from jumping to say that every signal in xt0 is the limit in that sense of a partial sum of a Fourier series? What's missing? What little thing is missing? OK, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let's go a little slower. Let's go a little slower. <coughs> OK, this big theorem applies to any Hilbert space. What's a Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is an inner product set, an inner product space for which, in which, whatever, every Cauchy sequence has a limit, right? Xt0, that is an inner product space, but as it happens, it's not a Hilbert space. So let me emphasize that. It doesn't turn out to be an issue. But I want to tell you that we can't apply the big theorem directly to xt0 because xt0 isn't quite a Hilbert space. doesn't have limits for all its Cauchy sequences. And interpreting that in terms of indecent versus decent signals, all that says is that you can have a sequence of decent signals that converges in that mean square sense to an indecent signal. <coughs> That's possible. However, xt0 is a subset in fact, a subspace of a Hilbert space. And I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. It has the quote unquote same inner product. And therefore, the same notion of orthonormal sequences. And in which the W's are still a complete orthonormal set.
OK. What is that Hilbert space? I'm going to call it L2 sub T0. And what this is, is the set of all x in C to the z, decent or not, for which the integral from 0 to T0 of x of t magnitude squared dt exists. And to be technically correct about this, again, we have to venture into Lebesgue integration and measure theory, which we're not going to do. That's a bigger set than xt0. But when I say <coughs> it has the same inner product, I mean for any x and y in this space, you can define inner product of x and y in exactly the same ways we did for xt0. Is that integral? The associated norm is going to be the same. And as it happens, those wk's constitute a complete orthonormal set. Yes? You wrote the set of all x in C to the z. You mean C to the r? C to the r, correct. Thank you. I'm thinking about the test tomorrow, which, which has f to the z all over the place. Thank you. OK. Yes, Alex? So, it's not added by this set all the Exactly. It turns out, yes. The, the, what do, you, what do you need to throw into xt0 to get L2t0? Answer, all the L2 limits of sequences in xt0. And so a theorem or a corollary of that is everything in L2t0 can be expressed as the limit of a sequence of decent things. So you can approximate indecent L2t0 signals as closely as you want with decent signals in a mean square sense. In the, in the monograph I gave one, it's like, it's, it's, it's a signal that looks like this. Um, it's zero at the integers, and then it goes like this. Um, where this is like x to the minus t to the minus one third or something like that. I, I forget what it is. But if you square this, it's not a decent signal because it blows up at all these points. But it's square integrable because if you in, if you you can integrate like t to the x to the minus two thirds and I forget what it is but it's in the monograph. Okay, so cool. We have a Hilbert space in which x t zero sits as a subset, and the W case thankfully are a complete orthonormal set in that space. So any signal in L two t zero, in particular, any signal in x t zero. So any x in L2 t0, and in particular, any x in x t0 has an ortho expansion as an infinite linear combo of the w's. So it's going to be the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, or let's write it in official form, in official limit form. x equals limit as n goes to infinity, the sum from k equals minus n to n of x wk times wk. What is inner product of x with wk?
The definition of the inner product of two signals is 1 over t0, integral from 0 to t0. You're going to have x of t and complex conjugate of wk of t, dt. And where's our definition of wk? It's up there. wk conjugate is e to the minus jk omega 0t. So I have 1 over t0, integral from 0 to t0, x of t, e to the minus jk omega 0t dt. And that's for all k. And that's a familiar formula. That's the formula for the k Fourier series coefficient for x. But we've derived it in a different way. We've derived it using this big theorem about orthogonal expansions in Hilbert spaces. So to emphasize what that inner product x with wk is, so that is to say, x inner product of wk is just going to be the k Fourier series coefficient of x. And what that expansion thing says, x equals the sum, or the limit of the sum, So the expression above for x is the same as the following. First I'll write it this way. Limit as n goes to infinity. Norm of x minus Sn of x squared equals 0. Okay where Sn of x is the nth partial sum over there. And the meaning of this all caps is the following. <laughs> Limit as n goes to infinity of the of 1 over t0 integral from 0 to t0 of the magnitude squared of x of t minus the sum from k equals minus n to n of x wk e to the jk omega 0 t all that squared dt equals 0. And the reason I'm writing that equation down there is it gives us another sense in which the Fourier series converges to x, namely in this mean square sense. So consequence of this, we know that we had that, that Fourier series thing, the bullet point highlight Fourier series converges if you have all these extra assumptions to the value of x at time t, if t is a continuity point, to the mean across the jump if it's not, blah, blah, blah. But if you're looking at just plain old decent signals with no additional assumption, the Fourier series always converges at least in this mean square sense. So for any decent signal, the Fourier series converges at least in this mean square sense.
under no further assumptions. And when I say no further assumptions, I mean those conditions like it has to be differentiable between its jumps and all that stuff. All right, so that is Fourier series as orthogonal expansions. That's example number one of using inner product spaces and Hilbert spaces and all that to try to understand signals in some sense. And we'll see others, well, at least one other. All right, so anyway, let's take the three-minute break, and then, then we'll pick it up after that. So now more people can leave without me. <laughs> All based on this stuff. It's so important, okay, and it's getting more so. So I suggest not ignoring Chapter 9 in the monograph. End of sermon. Okay, so why do we study Fourier series? Okay, so pause. Why, other than the fact that a really smart person invented them and they've been around for a long time and they have a nice clean theory and they can be recast as orthogonal expansions, why study them? Okay. And those of you who took 2200 for me last spring, you know, we, we talked a fair amount about this, so I'm going to go through, and, and you've probably seen it pitched this way in other classes, if not 2200. There are two sort of families of reasons why to study Fourier series. So one set of reasons has to do with signal analysis. Reasons that have to do with signal analysis. One thing you want to do a lot in life is if you have a complicated thing, you want to somehow express it in terms of simpler things, right? You want to decompose a complicated thing into some kind of combination of simpler things. And what decompose means and what combination means, well, that all depends on the application, the context. So what a Fourier series does, this is thing number one, A Fourier series sort of decomposes quote unquote complicated <coughs> periodic signals into combos of quote unquote simple periodic signals. If you think of these e to the jk omega 0 t type signals as being simple periodic signals, the paradigmatic periodic signal, the kind of periodic signal that if you asked a four-year-old what is their favorite periodic signal in the world and they didn't say square wave, they would say that. Okay. Then Fourier series take complicated things and decompose them into a combination and in this case the combination is actually a sum of simpler things. And by the way, Fourier series in that bullet point is a singular. It, a Fourier series decomposes. Okay, so it's not a grammar error on my part, despite what may appear. Okay, so that's one signal analysis reason. But another one is, and this is of particular importance to engineering applications. That's kind of a, a math thing. Fourier series gives us our first look at this idea of the frequency content of a signal. And that way of thinking pervades ECE. And really, there's no getting away from it. So Fourier series, and now I'm going to use it in the plural sense for periodic signals. give us our first look at the frequency content idea. Okay. And this P 
piece of the frequency content idea pertains only to periodic signals. And it sort of makes more sense in that context than it makes in the non-periodic signal sense, uh, context, which we'll get to shortly. Here's the basic idea. Here's what's going on. If you're given, say, x0, or x, I should say, and xt0, and you compute its Fourier series, So x of t is going to have a Fourier series, say, sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of ck e to the jk omega 0 t, where omega 0 is 2 pi over t 0. We talked about the terminology, you know, first harmonic, second harmonic, all that kind of thing, fundamental, everything. The relative magnitudes of the ck, well, first off, from that series, The way you interpret it in a, through a frequency content lens is, so you think as follows, x has frequency content only at the frequencies in the discrete set The set of all k omega 0 such that k is in the integers. Okay? The way that the magnitudes, the relative magnitudes of the ck vary, so the variation in ck over k displays how x's quote unquote signal energy. is allotted to these various frequencies. And you can go through all kinds of, you know, intuition, like if you have the CKs go to zero slowly, then it's a, if you think of it as a musical tone, it's a brassier tone. If they go to zero faster, it's a reedier tone. You know, there's all that kind of stuff. A little bit of discuss in the monograph. You've talked about this in previous courses, whatever. <coughs> Okay, so that's why, that's our first look at frequency content, and it makes perfect sense in the context of periodic signals, because we sort of understand that, you know, the only way that you can sum up periodic signals and get other periodic signals is that the periods are rationally related, so it has to expand in a series like this, and so any periodic signal can only have signal energy at integer multiples of some lowest frequency, blah, 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 okay? So it all makes sense. All right. That's a couple of important signal analysis reasons for studying Fourier series. And the other class of reasons So another set of reasons systems analysis reasons. And after all, this is a course in the mathematics of signal and system analysis, so it, it, it's good whenever we can take something we talked about and tell you why it's important to signals and why it's important to systems. All right, so what, what are the systems analysis reasons? The, it, the key idea here is the following. Suppose you have an LTI system. So given a linear time invariant system with impulse response H, Let's, let's suppose, just for the heck of it, suppose that 
the signal, say W, with specification WT is equal to e to the j, say omega 1t for all t. is an admissible input. That is to say, is convolvable with H. So it works as an input to the system. Let's figure out what S of X is or S of W. S of W is H convolved with W. That's what happens when you put something into an LTI system with impulse response H. So for each time T, S of W of T is going to be integral from minus infinity to infinity H of tau W of T minus tau D tau And now let's plug in what W is. Oh, by the way, uh, those of you in 3100, last week Kevin comes up to me as I'm about to leave my office and he says, I just have a quick question. The students tell me you have some special chalk. <laughs> and I said, are you teaching in a big room? He says, yeah, Upson B17. I say, and you're not using the big, thick chalk? And he said, no. I'm like, oh. Yeah, I was a yeah. no. no, he, <laughs> say, he says, he says the, students, the students tell me, you only write one equation for board. And I write 20. And they can't read them, right? No, I, I literally just told him like, at the end of the class, like, I've been sleeping like for the last four lectures. So, <laughs> I just couldn't read your stuff. So like, he just like crams it in his board. So, like, like, no. Like, well, I, I told him where to find the chalk. Yeah, so I was like, I was like, yeah, I was like, Professor Delcia is like, he writes really big. So, like, and, uh, he uses like really big chalk to like, make it well, now, now he knows where to get that chalk. <laughs> okay. So anyway, that, that's what, like, we got to finish this today. Okay, that, that's what the S of W of T is. Let's plug in what W T is. So S of W at time T is the integral from minus infinity to infinity, H of tau, and W of tau is E to the J omega 1 T minus tau, T tau, that's W T minus tau, I should say. So for all T. And we can factor out an e to the j omega 1t from that integral h of tau, e to the minus j omega 1 tau remains. So the value of the output in response to that particular input, provided it's allowed as an input at time t, is equal to this thing in parentheses, and that's a definite integral over an infinite interval. It's a number. This integral here is just a number. Okay, like let's call it lambda 1. And I'm naming it that way for a reason. So thus, S of W at time t is equal to lambda 1 times e to the j omega 1t. That's just W at time t, i.e., S of W equals lambda 1 W. Now you see why I named it lambda? Yeah? Who's, who's made that noise? <laughs> Was it Alex Rucker? No? <laughs> Was it David Landy? His lips are sealed. 
Okay, so what what is W kind of like here? This what does this remind you of from linear? Eigenvalues, right. Eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Matrix, you know, AX equals lambda one X, you know, that kind of thing. We say X is an eigenvector corresponding eigenvalue lambda one. This W is like an eigen input for the system corresponding to eigenvalue lambda one. Now you've heard me say this before if you took 2200 last spring, right? Didn't I use the, did I use the eigen input, the, the E word last spring? I think I did. So in this sense, this particular W is like an quote unquote eigen input. And if you, eigenvalue, that's another German thing. Okay, remember we have French things, German things. Does anyone know what eigen, what that prefix means in German? Um, yeah, but that, that's eigentlich. It's, okay, eigen, the prefix eigen, like, like it means own, like your own, like my own, what? Um, meine eigene Kaffee, you know, you know, that, my own coffee as opposed to yours. Or in soccer, maybe you'd have an own goal, an eigen, eigenes, whatever the word for goal in German is. Own goal, you know what that is, when you kick it in your own net or head it in your own net or something, right? Anyway, it's, it's the property of the system. It's its own sort of thing. It's the kind of thing that it's at home with the system, whatever. Okay, so it's an eigen input for the system S. And so what does a Fourier series do? It's supposing that all the terms in a Fourier series, suppose that... Suppose that it doesn't matter what omega 1 is. So that suppose that w of t equals e to the j omega t is an okay input for all omegas. So suppose w with specification w of t equals e to the j omega t for all t is an okay input. for all omegas. And there's going to be terminology for that. We won't do that today. It's going to be that the system has a frequency response. Then look at what happens when you put a periodic signal into the system. So you use a signal, a periodic signal, x of t, Fourier series, Weird, they don't use own goal in hockey for, for like, or actually, here's, here's actually what happens. If you see a hockey article and the writer says own goal, that means the writer is not really a hockey specialist. He or she is a soccer specialist. That's a very FIFA type of term. What do you call it instead? You don't, there's no universal name, I don't think. Like they always say, he, what's that? It depends. In hockey, it depends if it's if you're the last to touch the puck. Sometimes it's you. Sometimes if uh, the defenseman puts it directly in the goal, then it's definitely the nearest offensive player. You know. All right. So anyway, um, look what happens when you use a t zero periodic x as input, and say that x has Fourier series. Sum of CK, e to the JK omega 0 t. Now, each of the terms in the Fourier series is constant times an eigen input, right? So for each k, if I take, and I'm, I'm writing this very schematically now, if I take e to the JK omega 0 t and I put it into the system, What's going to come out is something times e to the jk omega zero t. 
let's call it lambda k e to the j k omega zero t, where lambda k is integral from minus infinity to infinity, h of tau e to the minus j k omega zero tau d tau. And ignoring completely questions of convergence, et cetera, et cetera, assuming everything behaves the way it's supposed to, So ignoring convergence issues, the output signal is this by linear and linearity. S of x of t equals the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of lambda k ck e to the j k omega zero t. That has specification that for all t. So right away we have from a Fourier series for the input a Fourier series for the output. Okay, these are the Fourier series coefficients of the output. And what the Fourier series constitutes in this sense is an eigenfunction expansion, so to speak, of the periodic signal x. And when you took linear algebra, one of the pitches whoever taught you the course gave you for figuring out eigenvalues was that a matrix acts on an eigenvalue in a particularly simple fashion, scales it by a number. So if I can decompose every vector in the, in the space to a sum of eigenvectors for the matrix in question, then I can figure out what that matrix does to any vector as a, sort of a combo of those simple things. And so, same thing here. Because these complex exponentials are, are eigen inputs, I'm just going to write down one more thing and then you can all go. So thus the Fourier series is thus, roughly speaking, at least an eigenfunction expansion or an eigen input expansion technique. Okay. So just have a little more to say about this next time, define the notion of frequency response, and then we'll move on to the next big topic, which is Fourier transforms. But anyway, prelim tomorrow, remind all your friends, right? Remind Brian. Remind Brian Chen, yes. <laughs> and, and Sam, and who else? Like, uh, who? Oh, Tomid. Hi, I meant to shout out to you a long time. I always pass him on the street when I'm walking on Brian, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, when this, the only, it turns out the only eigen signals for LTI systems are these complex exponentials. But if X is a periodic signal, you can decompose X as a sum of those.